We'll see. Oh, I'm Hi. Jamie. Hi there. Let me switch my view here. I don't know why Hi. Hi. Welcome. <laughs> Thank you. I'm, I have my video camera off because I'm going to be eating lunch while we're. <laughs> oh, that's fine. Day. You can you you can even share what you're eating. We can drool with you. No big deal. <laughs> <laughs> I think, but um, I thought we could get started. I have some good stuff to share with you today. And also I wanted to start off with Allegra had sent me a question during the week. Um, Allegra, meet Naya if you haven't met yet. Um, and so I wanted to cover that question because it was really interesting. And I had, she was actually asking about a particular client who I also see. And I saw her today, which was fun because then I could, um, check in with what Allegra was asking about and sort of figure out in more detail what it was. And so I'm going to present it. And this is a client who feels pain in her neck when she's doing the glute series on the arc. So the glute series, just to, I don't know if we have the same name. So just to tell you exactly what that is, it's going prone on the arc and doing double leg lifts, swimming legs, Charlie Chaplin, heels clicking, um, and then we also do what I call glute heel squeezes, which is bent knees to 90 degrees, heels together and pressing upward. So this, uh, Allegra was doing this exercise with her and she couldn't even focus on her glutes because she was having all this neck tension. And so here uh, to give you a little more background information on this particular client, because I feel like it's relevant in this case, She's hypermobile and has a hard time really organizing and stabilizing her muscles to activate her glutes in the first place. And that she actually has, especially in her glutes, but she actually has a hard time organizing her entire body because it's just loose and has this ability to move in places where most people's bodies don't get to move. Um, so she feels that the work, she feels work and irritation in her neck when she does the glute exercise on the arc, but she's okay if she does them flat on the floor without lifting her legs too far. She does even better if she has a ball between her ankles. So the main question is that I wanted to start walking you through, thinking through with you is why is it happening and what steps we could possibly do to change this pattern? So if, if I were to ask you, ladies, what do you think might be causing this to happen when she's doing the glute series on the arc and not when she's flat? Um, I was thinking that maybe when she was on the arc, she might have been tensing her neck because she was maybe lifting her uh, upper torso where uh, maybe she might have benefited from having it more relaxed. Um, mm -hmm. Or she was like focusing, because I know there, <clears throat> there's like a, a couple of ways, to, you know, you can increase the intensity of the exercise by having your head down or having it up. And if she was having her, maybe she had her head up and she was just focusing way too hard on keeping her head up. So, um, yeah. And then she's just, I feel like that she's just, maybe she just tightened like everywhere. Um, and it was just because she's so hyper flexible that it's hard to maybe just focus the energy down and just to the glutes, even mm -hmm. though it would be good to have her on the arc because her back is in that nice um, uh, below neutral position. Right. So I agree. The purpose of the arc would be to keep her lower spine more stable, more neutral than it hyper extending as she would want to do. Yeah. Um, so, so the arc is to help um, keep the work out of the lower spine. Or she's just, um, maybe she's just having one of those days that she was overloaded already. And um, I don't know if she has like five fibromyalgia and at all. I know we had mentioned that with a different client before, but, or, you know, just the act of lifting her legs up that, you know, that range of motion on the arc, maybe it wasn't, maybe she's not there yet. That was my other thought. Yeah. Um, so maybe the range. Of, I guess the distance, yeah. distance from the floor to the. It's too great. And she's um, extending, right? 
Yeah. Uh, she's overloading into her now. Yeah, I mean overloading, yeah. Okay. I, I think those are all great thoughts. Nai, did you have any thoughts maybe to add that you would want to add? Well, I honestly, I was reading her background um, as you were chatting and I was kind of, I was thinking about lower back and pelvic alignment. Mm -hmm. And then also was thinking about that the arc is meant to help prevent the hyperextension, mm -hmm. but also there's less stability overall being on the arc versus like lying flat on the floor in prone position. Yeah. So if she's hypermobile, perhaps as Allegra said, she's finding other ways of the body compensating <laughs> through the spine to yeah. um, make up for not being supported by the floor. Right. And, and I agree. I think that that's what's happening. So I think you're both on track, right? So the arc does create a space. And I actually had her demonstrate that to me. And just so I'll show you what she looked like on there. So we, she had the arc this way. And then she was on it and she came into this position and she was trying to hold here, which is lovely if she can do it. But what was happening is this. And then the, the more she would try and lift, the more this would happen. And it was really hard for her. And even if she tried to lengthen, she got stuck here. So she was working so hard to lift here. She couldn't keep herself. And if we try and go lower down, uh, then she can't lift the legs. It's not enough. So there just wasn't enough support for her. So she was overloading exactly as you were saying, like a, into the neck to find a way to help herself get through that exercise, trying to get to her glutes. So, uh, but the premise for having her on the arc is absolutely right, right? We wanna try and keep her out of that lumbar spine. We were trying to help her have less lumbar extension and get her more focused into the glutes. So in somebody who's not so hypermobile or not so having so much difficulty with her, her positioning, I think that the arc would be a fantastic option. Um, so, so great. So we figured out why it's happening. Um, so what steps can we take? I think I'll just say the obvious thing is have her do it off the arc, right? <laughs> so don't use arc. That would be one step. But um, if you can think about now in more of a muscular terms, what does this tell you about her upper quadrant? If she can't go prone and stabilize in, in air, so with gravity against the back of her head, what does that tell you is missing in her body? I don't know, upper ab stability? Or? Okay, maybe. Go higher. The neck flexor stability? Yes, neck flexor strength, right? So if she can't, so it's one thing to be able to stabilize vertical. Gravity's here, so it's hard, but it's not so hard. And she's actually a little bit like this. When she's here, she's not like this when she's standing here already. So, but she can, she can manage with gravity and that's not bothering her so much, right? But once we take that posture and we put it that way, right? So she's this way, all of a sudden this becomes an issue. She cannot stabilize this, right? So weakness in the anterior neck flexors and tightness in the posterior, the short posterior muscles. So the posterior capodine muscles, the superior, the obliques, those little tiny short muscles that go up to the cap or the skull, the capitis muscles are tight and short. So we need probably two things. And, and you know, in hypermobile bodies, it's always sort of a golden thing when you find the tight muscles in a hypermobile body. And I guarantee you that every hypermobile body has some tight muscles. If they're, uh, they could be really uh, small, like the capodine muscles, or they could be really big, like a piriformis. But if you can find a hypermobile body 
um, you will eventually, hopefully, find out which muscles are over tight. Or it could be something like a big, they hold in spasm in one area because of that tightness that they're trying to protect. Uh, they create a tightness with spasm because they're so loose everywhere else. So that might be, a, that could be a case as well. So with her, it seems that her neck flexors are weak. Her capodi muscles are tight. So if that's the case, what then do I need to do? And Allegra, you already mentioned, um, you already mentioned upper abs, right? So maybe she needs more upper ab control. Yes, because what would upper ab control do for the head posture? Make it more stable. It can make it more stable, especially if we go tummy down, right? If I don't have control tummy down in my ribs, they're going to go like this. And my head's going to do this. Right. Yeah. Cause it's nothing to, to pull it to down. Exactly. So if I can control here, I can then find some length out here. So upper abs could definitely be one thing that we need to work on. We need to work on neck flexors a little bit. Um, how do you work on neck flexors? What, what are some strategies to work on neck flexors? Just that chin, chin, chin tuck, but that's, tricky too because you know people have a tendency to over chin tuck and exactly. working on that um I guess feeling like almost like you're gonna like kind of swallow I guess that's how I would describe it you know like mm -hmm. that feeling when they're working yeah um okay you're on the right track I think yes you could definitely do chin tuck this way what would be a way so I, this is what would be a secret way to work the neck flexors without telling the client that you're even working the neck flexors? Cat, cat, cow? Kind of, yes, why? What about the cat, cow? Because the spine is going into to flexion. And so if they're looking, you know, if the head is looking down towards the belly as well, it will create that nice curve there. Okay, so do we need the cat, cow? Or do we just need quadruped or quadruped yeah quadruped <laughs> right, yeah. right. Yeah. So now this is our secret way for strengthening the neck flexors because i can have them hold neutral i can have her really think about stretching the back of the neck here and then i can challenge this with anything i want so if if i i can challenge this position so if you want to strengthen somebody in the upper quadrant one of my favorite ways to do that is in a quadruped position or in a prone position, prone position on the box where their head's off the box, for example. So anything prone where just their head is off. So it's more supported than the arc potentially, but still giving them a fight against gravity, a fight against gravity to hold that posture. And then we're actually working these without having to say, okay, drop your chin, you know, and get into a wrong posture. We can actually work them in the posture that we want them to bring upright. And they don't even have to necessarily know that you're working on neck flexors. You know, so that's, a, that's a great point because I think I remember after we did, and maybe I'm getting confused with another client that we did, um, we went to quadruped afterwards, but she had a really hard time not hyperextending her elbows and then getting into that serratus um you know to find the strength to hold herself there and we just i mean i think we just did leg back or maybe we did point to dog I, I i can't remember but i know that we were in quadruped but i remember i encountered those issues mm -hmm. yeah and i tried to show her and it was um it was it was it was it was hard it was hard yeah, yeah. so if quadrupeds too much just put them prone with their head off the box and the beauty of the box right versus the art is you can decide how much do you want us to have them stable or not, right? So yeah, that's, that's a great point. Yeah, because it's just, when you just okay. working with the head there. Right, I could start the person this way. So there's not a lot, everything else is supported. My arms are relaxed. And I'm just teaching them to look straight down. And then I can work with, like, if they show up like this, I can work with, okay, let's pull the back of the neck long. Good, pull the nose into your skull, right? I can get shoulders down. I can even have them put their hands here. So these are great ways to start off. And in fact, with her today, we spent time 
We spend time on all fours and we spend time prone. And some of the exercises we did were uh, reverse knee stretch, which I don't know if you all have the same names for those, but that was where your knees are up at the shoulder rest of the reformer and your hands are on the side rails and you're bringing, stabilizing, bring your knees up under you. And then I did that prone on the box for her. And then we did, um, those are the two main ones we did there. And then I switched gears a little bit. So I got, that was for the neck flexors. There's something else you can do to create space and length and alignment for the head and neck and, and connect it to the lower body. I'm giving you a hint, but connect it to the lower body. What could connect my upper to my lower that might help my posture? Any thoughts? Connects to the top of the pelvis, goes into the arm. The lats? The lats? Yes. Lat, right. Lat folds of some sort. Right. So my favorite here is, so connecting lats downward to the pelvis is going to create that stability through Oh no, Zanny, you froze. It looks like the lights went out too. Oh, there oh, she she's is. back. Sorry, Hi. we had a little power down for a moment here. Okay, so, uh, sorry, I was showing you, oh, the lots. We just talked about the lots briefly, right? So- Yeah, you're gonna show us what you were going to do yeah. with your arms and then I put my arms up and it went bye-bye. Yeah. <laughs> so what, what can connect right from up to down again and create, we want to create a pathway for the head and neck and the head and neck is really an extension of the thoracic spine, right? It's all one spine. So the cervical spine and head are sitting right on the top. So I like to think of it all as one and to connect it from top down, the lats are a great source for us and a great helper. So I had her start with double seated double lap pulls, which is on the end of the Cadillac there with the bar with fingertips on. And we worked on pulling down, but not just, it's not about pulling down. It was about lifting her body up. So as she's seated, she's pulling down and her body grows taller in her seat, right? And so we did that a few times and she was able to feel that lift off her seat a little bit, which tells me that she's starting to connect. And she said she could feel it in her sides a little bit up here. So that was perfect. And then we took it to standing and I had her doing my, what I call getting taller on the tower springboard, standing on the floor, pulling the lap bar, the, the rollback bar down to her thighs and taking her weight forward. So pulling down, growing up tall. Yeah, so same idea, but now coming from the floor up tall all the way up through the head. That obviously was more challenging for her than seated would be, but that was the start of it. So we started working on that connection to create more length and distance from her head, uh, in her head. So more length and stretch in the spine, right? So all of those things would progress her to finding more length, finding more strength, finding this better posture for her head, and then being able to put that against gravity, which would be taking her all the way back to the arc. And the other way to get that pull, I had, excuse me, I had her go to the glute series on the floor last, right? So she said that that doesn't bother her neck. And I said, great, let's go do that to end up the session after all this, we'll try and put it all together. And so I had her lay on, she has a little Cadillac at home. I had her lay on her Cadillac and she put, and then she started, she could get the glutes up, but I still saw the breaking in the spine a little bit. So what you were initially worried about a leg with her overarching the lower spine was happening, right? Prone, flat, and she's getting an arch when she tries to lift up and get her glutes. So what we did is I had her reach her hands up to the top of the Cadillac while she tried to lift the leg. So she laid down on the Cadillac and I had her hook her arms at the top edge here. And then when she, before she started to lift, I had her pull 
and then float. And her head and neck went in exactly the right place. And she could still activate in her tummy. I didn't have her, I told her to reach her legs long, not really worry about lifting. And we got her in this position here and she could feel the length in her neck without any tension. So it was a matter of activating downward, finding the length through, getting her head long, and then not lifting so much with the legs, but then being able to find that connection through, through the body, through the middle of the body. Mm. Yeah. So that's where we ended. <laughs> but that, so she's going to need a lot of work in finding that, but that's how I, I thought it was just a great way to connect from top to bottom, right? And to start working her strength against gravity with her head and neck so that she doesn't overload when she has to hold that head up. She can find that connection and use the link to hold her up. Yeah. So I was just thinking um, a progression from that, you know, when she gets stronger, could be facing the risers, doing that on the box kind of movement. Yeah, holding yeah. the risers or... Yeah. Yeah, exactly. That could be a progression and maybe just starting with a shoulder blade shrug downward to get that feeling. Exactly. That's exactly right. Yeah. Um, yeah, does that make sense? Yeah, it, it really does. And, um, you know, that's why I, I need you because I didn't, I didn't even, you know, I got to quadruped and then it was like, okay, this other set of problems with the getting into the neck and serratus and alignment. And then if you just take the components of the arms out and just get, you know, take the arms off, like just get her flat, then you can just separate the head and get to what I wanted to work on, which that, that was a great cue on just, you know, take the arm component out of it. And then, yeah, that's great. Yeah, very helpful. Thank you, Zaina. Yeah, you're welcome. Great. Yeah, I think, I think where I don't go into the session thinking um, this is what I'm going to do and this is how it's going to work out. I kind of go into the session, especially with her, uh, with somebody, some, Somebody like this with the hypermobility is not going to be a predictable client. You can go in with the best prepared list of exercises you want to get through with this person and feel like I'm so prepared going into the session. And after two exercises, you could be like, let me just crumple that up and throw it away. And I have to rethink this whole thing because yeah, it doesn't go as planned. Yeah. 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 And, and that's actually fine. And then where I would encourage you, and I think Allegra, I know you as a teacher, I think you're doing a good job of this, but it's, it's a challenge. Like all of a sudden, you, sometimes that panic comes in like, okay, now what do I do with this person? But yeah. what, I, what I start doing is I start rolling through my head and just watching. So if, if I get stuck with, okay, this isn't working the way I want, I'm not going to continue that. And, and I'm, I think it's okay to say to the client, this is not targeting exactly what we want. Let's change it up a little bit. And I try and think of, a, of what is, what am I seeing going wrong here? And if I'm seeing something going wrong here, I just take that one piece, like the head neck position was going wrong. And so how would I fix a head neck position that's going wrong? What are the components that make that head neck go wrong? And how can I rethink that posture for this person so that we can achieve the goal of completing this one exercise? Right, keeping it simple. Yeah. Yeah. So just maybe see what's going on and go, okay, I need to figure out what is going wrong, how I'm going to deal with just that component as, and as much as you can stabilize the rest of the body while you're going after that component. So you don't have to worry about 10 parts of the body and then um, move, move from there and see what you can do. So her, this client is seen as mostly because of hip osteoarthritis and hypermobility issues related. Uh, but after the class, she felt lighter on her hip. Why? Because we connected top to bottom and she was able to support her torso without sinking downward into her hip. 
right? So even though it seems like, okay, I've gotten so far away from the hip, if I don't fix her posture all the way up the chain, she's going to be heavy on that hip. So she'll feel better when she's connected, right? So, so yeah, that kind of just to encourage you uh, to just see what you're, see what's going wrong and, and be okay with, okay, I need to deal with that little piece for this session. And that would be good. So Okay. Yeah. You're probably going to have to remind me again, many times, but yes, thank you. That's okay. That's okay. All right. So I put another um, case study on here, a different case. Do you, I, I didn't ask if you guys had any new, before I go to this one, if you guys had anything that you wanted to bring up. I don't, I just love listening to your cases and learning from that. Okay. Awesome. Well, when it does, you shout it out like last time. <laughs> okay. Oh, I will. Don't worry. <laughs> I have more, but I, I, I love learning from the clients you guys see as well. Okay. Awesome. So this one is, um, a pretty new to me client. Uh, I'll read you off her case study here. So she's 59 year old female client comes in with complaints of pain in her lower back. She's an athlete, but over the past year and a half has been working from home due to COVID and has not been moving as much as before. I actually should probably interject here that she was at a standing desk at work. She's at a sitting desk at home. Okay. And so she also used to go to strength training classes, but is not doing those anymore either. Her preference for exercise has always been running, but now standing and running seem to aggravate her while sitting and spinning, even at high intensity, seem to help her feel better. She's had back pain before, and last time Pilates really helped her feel better. She's been taking anti-inflammatories per the doctor's recommendation, and it seems uh, to dull her symptoms quite a bit. She's had a comparative MRI from a week ago to that of several years ago when she initially had this pain before. And she has a slight scoliosis, a slight anterior lolisthesis of L4-5 and severe foraminal stenosis that's pressing on the nerves, exiting the prim primarily at L4-5 level. She wants to stay active and healthy in hopes that you can help her or that we can help her. Um, so I also, after I wrote this up, I, I, she did give me her MRI and I also um, have that. And I thought I, I was going to ask you, would you like to review her MRI together or is that too overwhelming information or would that be helpful for you guys? Um, I've never seen one, so um, I would be a new, new newbie at this. Yeah. It's a, I just have the report actually, not the films. Oh, the report. Okay. Yeah. I would love to hear the report. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Let me, sure. yeah. I'll, I'll um, share a screen with you on that one. Let me just pull it up here. Sorry for the black marks. I just wanted to make sure to protect her privacy. Mm -hmm. um, so here uh, is the first page of it. Basically this was done a week ago and this is where we started History, her history is low back pain radiating to the lower extremities. They suspect spinal stenosis. So you guys know what spinal stenosis is. Yeah, it's the narrowing of either the central canal or the foramen where the nerves exit. So that's what they're suspecting or suspecting with, the, with her. Um, the comparison is made with an MRI dated April 12, 2016. So this is five years ago or so. Um, and she does have a little bit of a uterus issue, which I don't know anything about. And so for our purposes, we are, I'm, I have not paid attention to that. I'm going to let her doctor take care of that. And then um, it's just, I just highlighted a few things here. There is some scoliosis. So, and that was unchanged. So that's the same as when they saw the MRI on April 12th, 2016. And then we start, they start dividing up by levels. So here they, they break it up into levels and go through. So this page starts with T11, 12 through L23. They see mild disc degeneration, which is normal, just a mild degeneration. No anterior, anterior lateral disc osteophyte complexes, meaning, so osteophytes are just overgrowth of bone. There's nothing that's really of, of worry here. Um, there is mild facet joint osteoarthritis. So facet joint is where top the spine from above hits the one from below. There's a facet joint on each side of the vertebra. 
So there, having some osteoarthritis there, a little bit of mild arthritis means it's just rubbing a little, there's a little friction. So the surfaces are just not quite as smooth as you would have it be if you didn't have any osteoarthritis, right? But usually we don't worry so much about that. So let me pull up this next one. Okay, so I thought I'd just highlight a few things that I ended up highlighting a lot of it. So, so we came from L1, 2, now we're looking at levels L3, L4. Here there's disc degeneration and a moderate loss of disc height. Now remember, she's only 59, so she's not very old. If, if the person was 80, we would think about moderate loss of disc height, we'd be like, eh, that's probably fine. Probably normal, we're losing disc height at 80. But a moderate loss at 59, and if you saw her, you wouldn't even know she's 59, right? She's very young and healthy looking. So it's a little bit concerning already. I was a little bit concerned already just with moderate loss of disc height already. So, and then here there's a circumferential disc osteophyte complex. So something's happening around the disc already with a little bit of bony changes. Then we get to this, there's severe bilateral facet joint osteoarthritis with moderate effusions and mild facet joint bone edema. So there's severe facet osteo osteoarthritis already. So a lot happening at those facet joints. Osteoarthritis, and it's creating inflammation. The bones are a little bit swollen. That's what that bone edema is talking about. And then you see facet joint proliferation proliferative change and spondylolysis, which is, which is osteoarthritis, contribute to mild central spinal canal stenosis and mild bilateral lateral recess stenosis where the disc osteophyte complex contacts, and this is really key, contacts both descending L4 nerve roots. So they're talking about enough changes happening there at those facet joints at the foramen where the nerves exit are getting smaller. And it's causing contact with the nerve as it's exiting the foramen. So the nerves are getting irritated already, just trying to get out of the spinal cord into the body, right? And this is again at the L4, the L4 nerve root at the L34 level. So then there's also mild right and moderate left foraminal stenosis. So the foramen itself has some stenosis and then the disc osteophyte complex contacts both exiting L3 nerve roots lateral to the neur neural foramen. So L3 nerve is also getting touched by something. And it's okay if you don't know exactly what that looks like, but just knowing L4 nerves got something on it, L3 nerves getting contact from something else, the nerves should be pretty upset by that or will be. Then if we look at L4-5 level, there's a grade one anterior lolisthesis. So anterior lolisthesis is the most common form of a spondylolisthesis, meaning in this case, it means that L4 is slightly forward of L5. When it's grade one, we're really not that concerned with it. It just maybe note that she's a little bit unstable there. And with spondylolisthesis, the contraindication is lumbar extension, right? And putting them in extension will make that anterior lolisthesis go more anterior. So extending the spine at the L45 level is not ideal for her, right? And, and if you had a chance to look at her posture, she has one of those postures where her spine actually goes in right at the L45 level and then comes back out. So this has probably been postural for her whole life over time. And that's why now it's slipping slightly forward. So then we get into disc degeneration, moderate loss of disc height, irregular circumferential disc osteophyte complex, so asymmetric to the right. So this disc osteophyte complex is just not in any level doing fantastically well. There's severe bilateral facet joint osteoarthritis with moderate facet joint effusions and mild facet joint bone edema. So still some swelling, not as bad as higher up here. And then we also come, she also has facet cyst, right? A facet cyst is just a fluid filled sac, usually a fluid filled structure um, that is a result a lot of times from inflammation or friction, but having a cyst there, right? At the peripheral rim, it's, um, 
And it's coming here. If you continue reading, it's indents the posterior lateral fecal sac posterior to the L5 vertebral body and contacts the descending right sacral nerve roots, including S1 and S2. So now also because of this cyst that's formed, she has pressure on her S1 and S2 nerve roots as they're coming out into the sacral area. So uh, then she also has spondylolysis, which is arthritis, contributes to severe central spinal canal stenosis at the L4-5 disc level. So severe central stenosis means the central canal is, is gotten a lot smaller around the cord. So of all the information that we have now, this is the most concerning piece. Uh, and then we also have severe bilateral lateral recess stenosis with compression of both descending L5 nerve roots. Severe right and moderate to severe left foraminal stenosis with compression of both exiting L4 nerve roots in the neur neural, um, neural foramina. The spondylolysis again is moderately progressed. The facet joint osteoarthritis has mildly progressed. The facet joint synovial cyst has mildly decreased in size. And then here an L5S1, we have some mild loss of disc height. We're not worried about that. There is the disc osteophyte complex. There is severe bilateral facet joint osteoarthritis with small facet joint effusions, no stenosis. So, and this was not changed from the last time. And then always, so that's the big description. Always at the end of the MRI, they have this impression and where they'll list out what they think is the most important things to be followed up on. Uh, because it's the radiologist who reads the films and writes the report. And so for the radiologist, these are the things that, that they would say come most to light. And sometimes there's a big list like this, and sometimes there's a really short list. In this case, just noting that there is some scoliosis that was higher up. Um, there's the spondylolysis, which is arthritis, and facet joint osteoarthritis as detailed. Includes severe facet joint osteoarthritis at L3-4 and L4-5, where there's a facet joint effusions and joint bone edema. There's also facet joint osteoarthritis L5-S1, a little anterior lolisthesis at L4-5, moderate to severe central spinal canal stenosis L4-5, mild central spinal canal stenosis L3-4, right? Lateral recess stenosis, including mild bilateral L3-4 and severe bilateral L4-5 compression of both descending L5 nerve roots in the lateral recesses at L4-5, foramal stenosis, including moderate left at 3-4, moderate to severe left L4-5 and severe L4-5. Again here, L4-5 um, spondylolysis has progressed at L3-4 and L4-5 compared to the previous exam. And the facet joint osteoarthritis at L4-5 has mildly progressed. And then she has the fibrotic facet joint synovial cyst extending anterior inferiorly from the right L4-5 facet to the right posterior lateral epidural space posterior to the L4 vertebral body. So it indents the posterior lateral fecal sac contacting descending right sacral nerve roots, including S1 and S2. The facet joint synovial cyst has decreased in size, that's good. Um, and the, but the fibrosis around the cyst has progressed. So it's becoming more fibrous and less fluid filled. Um, so that's a lot. That's a lot of information that she has there that we are concerned about. And the things that we're most concerned about are the things that cause pressure on the nerves, right? So in her case, she has a lot of pressure on her nerves, directly on her nerves, starting at the L3-4 level. So it's surprising that she's even standing up at all, <laughs> I think, with that much pressure on her nerves. So I, I wanted to share that with you just to show you that kind of how her symptoms match her MRI. In this case, her symptoms are actually less than I would expect. If I read that MRI, I would think, uh-oh, this person's hardly going to be able to walk, let, get out of bed and walk because there's so much pressure on their nerves. She's up and moving and spinning and trying to run and sitting at her desk working all the time. So sometimes what you see in the MRI doesn't cause a lot of pain. And sometimes you'll see something very little in the MRI and the person will have a lot of pain. So in her case, I think she's reporting a lot less pain than I would expect and symptoms. She does complain of pain going down in her right buttock area, 
And that's likely from the L, um, S12 nerves being pressure, pressured. But here I'm really concerned about all those nerves that are being pressured. Um, she has a little bit of disc height loss um, in some places more than we would like or more than we would think for somebody her age. So right now, if you think about her now, what, what do you think of? <laughs> what are you thinking after all that? I'm afraid to hurt her <laughs> any further than she's already hurting. <laughs> yes, rightfully so, right? I'd be afraid, I'm afraid to hurt her. That, and that's a good reaction, right? I'm, I'm afraid to hurt her. But in that mindset, okay, so now that's good. You're gonna proceed with caution. So what are things you won't do? That's how Thank I kind of run. Through. Sorry, go ahead. So I would not have her in prone in extension, like you're doing any like the back extensor exercises. Right. And actually the first thing that comes to mind, cause I have had some uh, L4, L5, L5, S1 issues myself with pressure on the nerves. It, what helped me a lot was doing really gentle pelvic tilts, specifically Northern pelvic tilts. So just from my own personal experience, that's what I would see if is safe for her. Mm -hmm. Yes, it is safe for her. I did that. Oh, good. <laughs> yes. And it does help her. Um, so gently, gently pelvic tilting. Yes. And why does that help? Do you know why, why in your mind did that help you? Well, I'm thinking about the placement of L4, L5 in particular, L3, L4 also, but particularly L4, L5, um, and how, when you curl the pelvis North, how it lengthens the space between those vertebra yeah. and provides a little reprieve from the compression that she's probably feeling. Yeah. And I would imagine running and standing are also leading to that high impact with running and then just the long-term standing with compression, especially if she has a posture in which she has like a hyperlordosis. Mm -hmm. um, that it's just exacerbating that. And I would imagine when she's sitting or spinning, she might have more awareness to her posture and be able to get more length in the lower spine, even though like hinging forward from the hips, isn't always great for everybody for her. It's going to cause a little, draw a little bit more length into the lower mm -hmm. spine. If she's not letting her belly hang in the, right. Okay. And what do you think her posture looks like on the bike? If she's telling you she gets relief on the bike, based on what you just told me, what do you think she does when she sits on the bike? I think she uses her lower abs and pelvic floor <laughs> to and help her pelvis and lower spine and neutral. And do you think, I, I don't even think she holds a neutral. I bet you she rides the bike. Girl. like this. Yeah. Yeah. And a little bit of a tuck. So my guess is that she's found a way to ride the bike in a touch position. And that does what your coccyx curl does, right? Yeah. So it opens up and lengthens. So it'd be interesting. I haven't put her on the bike to see what she looks like on the bike. Um, but my guess is that that's exactly what she's doing. And my guess is that in sitting, she's not sitting straight up with a nice neutral spine. My guess is that she's sitting in a little bit of flexion as well, even a little bit. I mean, she may not be totally slouching, but even a little bit, as you probably know, in the sacral area, right, provides that rounding already. And that's gonna create the space like the coccyx curl as well. Whereas in standing, you mentioned it, now the hyperlordosis is compressing. And anything extension wise, which you said you're not gonna do for right, rightfully so, is what she's doing in standing is she's compressing. Yeah, and she's going sense. into a little bit of extension. Yeah, so perfect, that's great. So um, I want to encourage you that while the initial is like, yikes, um, I think that you have a lot of knowledge, both of you, all of you, that you can use to help somebody like this, right? And my, uh, well, let's go through, what, what do you think she needs most? I think you've already mentioned that, but um, what does she need most? Getting into the coccyx curls, but not just doing the coccyx curls, focusing on length and really scooping and getting into those lower abs. Yes, into lower abs. That would be great. 
Yeah. So getting lower abs strong and finding length. Those are exactly right. Two things I would very much go after. Yeah. So um, what other things could you do to relieve pressure for her? Any other particular exercises or any other thoughts about what you could do to help her? Bridging, bottom lift. What kind of bridging? What kind of bottom lift? The, you know, the, um, the, the bridging to the coccyx curl. Yes, coccyx the coccyx curl, right? Yeah. Through the coccyx curl, so bridge rolling. Bridge rolling, yes. Rolling up, not bridge extending the spine bridge, right? Not like yoga bridge, pressing up, but the bridge where you're rolling up through coccyx curl. Right, and you would do bottom lift the same way if you were taking it to the reformer, right? In through the same, same way, coccyx curl upward. Yes, exactly. What else? What are some great exercises that unload the spine? Cadillac, I think, maybe? Springboard Cadillac? Oh, knees, knees over bar. Yes. So we call it knees over bar, but basically laying supine, putting your knees over the rollback bar uh, of the springboard or the tower and having them rest there or having them do some toe taps if they can do it, keeping that spine neutral. And in her case, you might even want to keep her with a little wedge or something to help her keep more uh, neutral or more posterior tilted for now. Yeah. So kind of what I was thinking is actually like a slight inversion even mm -hmm. as long as her pelvis is curled. With tailbone. Yep. Curled. That would help. Yeah. You will uh, in her case. So if, so the problem with her is facet joints really primarily, right? Facet joints and steno not stenosis, um, yeah, foraminal stenosis, really those are the main things. We're, we are concerned about that central canal stenosis. So if she were to report numbness and tingling on both sides and loss of bowel or bladder control, that is an alarm, right? So that's a question that you wanna ask um, that maybe doesn't come as naturally to, to us in the Pilates world, but if somebody were to complain of loss of control of bladder or bowel, that's a big alarm for somebody with this much compression happening, because that could mean that she's getting pressure on the spinal cord itself, right? Or weakness in both legs, that would be a very high alert type of sign that you would wanna send her back to the doctor for right away. If that's the case, they would most likely go in surgically and open up the canal to create more right. space. Go. Bye. Okay, no problem. Yeah. Um, so that would be sort of an emergency situation. Um, mm -hmm. But otherwise, uh, you could still work with her to create that length. Um, you could work with her to create that curl, but you would also want to be super careful of compressing her discs because she has so much of that reduced disc height that you wouldn't want to load those discs very much either. So I would be careful of like really inverting or doing anything in a loaded flexion, even though technically it's not contraindicated for somebody with a facet joint issue or a stenosis issue, if that makes sense. Yeah, absolutely. I had been wanting to ask you about one of the terms on the MRI impression. Yeah. Um, the facet joint effusion. I'm not familiar. I know what the facet joint is, but I don't know what effusion means. Basically, swelling, irritation uh, of that joint. So okay. redness, you could imagine. So basically, infl inflammatory process happening. Okay, thank you. Yeah, yeah, you're welcome. All right. Well, hopefully that was helpful. <laughs> yeah, that's super helpful. Thank you so much, Dana. I really appreciate you're it. Welcome. You're very welcome. I so appreciate that you share your knowledge and experience with all of us. It's um, it's wonderful to be a part of this little community and thank you for taking the time to create it. Yeah, you're welcome. Thank you for being part of it.